All right, as we're having a, a Bible-themed month, we're going to talk about spiritual growth through scriptural growth this month. I want to emphasize here in, the, in 1 Peter chapter 1, at the end of the chapter, if you look there in verse 23, it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Now, we're born again. That means you're born spiritually. Uh, that happens as John 3, 3, Jesus said, you must be born again, right? To go to heaven, you must be born again. He says, not of corruptible seed here, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I want you to understand something that God's word is alive and it abides forever. It is incorruptible. You cannot corrupt it. There are certain things that will corrupt in this world. Even gold will corrupt in this world. Uh, uh, the wood and the carpet and the walls and the bricks, all of that can fall apart and deteriorate. But we have certain things that are incorruptible in the resurrection. We will be like the Lord Jesus Christ, incorruptible. We will never fall apart or fade away or lose any power or energy, anything like that in the resurrection. But here here he says, his word is incorruptible. Now his word was spoken. It came through the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so these prophets said something. Others heard it and memorized it and some wrote it down. And it's been written down and written down and carried down through the generations to us. Now, this month we're going to talk about the history of the Bible and where it came from. There are two different lineages of Bibles. Over here on one side you have a few, and it's the originals that brings us to the Texas Receptus, generally speaking, that gives us what we call the King James Version today. And then over here you have another Bible that comes from another lineage, and it's essentially Catholic. And that lineage today gives us three or four hundred brand new Bibles since 1900. They change things. They remove things. And today it's controversial to say that we're old-fashioned or we take the old paths or to say that we're traditional. And I'm not talking about stale or dying or old fuddy-duddies or whatever word you'd come up with. Hey, listen, if you haven't noticed, this church is alive and thriving and we have a pulse and we're excited for the Word of God and we're excited for what God's doing. But you know what? We have a new spirit, but we have the old way. We have the old Word. It's the same Bible that has existed throughout time. And so we'll talk about this month but today I want, I want to give you a few different things. I want to show you from the Bible, comparing to the other Bibles, what has been deleted. If I could get some young men, if I could get a couple of the ushers to grab some of those yellow handouts that are on the back and give everybody that can read one, uh, including me, I, I need one also. It's, uh, Brother Harry's laughing. It's, it's debatable if I can read. I know, I know. Uh, this is a super giant print, so I can see it. So, uh, no, I think it's an 18 point font. It's the biggest I could find, okay? Uh, but yeah, so uh, the God's Word is incorruptible. It cannot be changed. It has been preserved. It is forever. And no matter what Satan tries to do, he cannot eliminate it. He cannot get it to go away. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your help. Okay, so it is not corruptible. And he says that it abideth forever. Now, we need a Bible scholar to tell us what forever means. Can anybody help me out with that? Does that mean forever and ever? I mean, amen. God's Word is true. It's been established in heaven, it says. Forever. God's Word will last the test of time. It will surpass all these new Bibles. They have to update them every few years because they say, oh, we forgot something. Oh, we missed something. Oh, we really messed that one up. Ten years later, we better change something and make it different. Now, uh, here's uh, 300 verses, and we're going to look at them all today. Just kidding. This is your homework. I'm going to ask you on Wednesday. I'm going to ask. I'm just going to pick one and ask. No, I'm just kidding. All right, this is for you. Keep it in your Bible. You can share it with somebody. I have this as a single-page printout. I can email you. It's on the web. Um, I'll try to put it in the description of this video so you can share it with others on social media, print your own copy, whatever you want. Uh, but on the back side of this, and this is not original to us. This is somebody else's work, and I'm thankful for it. Although I don't condone everything that ministry does or teaches. But here's what I do condone: the Word of God, the Bible. It's forever. It's incorruptible. You cannot corrupt it. Uh, now, if you'll notice on this page, if you guys will get there, it says the following complete verses are taken away. And I want to give you the big four. 
I, I know this is a lot to memorize, and I'll tell you what I did a long time ago with this Bible, and what I try to do with any new Bible, is I'll go through the Bible, and where it's changed, I'll underline it. I personally use a green highlighter. Because I like to underline and draw and write in my Bible. But when I see a little green highlighter under a portion of a verse, oh, I know that the other Bibles have attacked that, deleted it, removed it, or changed it drastically. So at a glance, I can keep all this information with me in my Bible. That's how I do it. I'd recommend you consider something similar, okay? Uh, if you're ever wondering while we're preaching, if I just say, and they delete this out of the other Bibles, you're thinking, man, he sure has memorized a lot. No, no, no. I did the work in advance so that it would be easy for me to share this information with others, okay? So on the back, though, this is a big deal. The uh, big... Uh, what is it, 17 or 18 verses, but I want to give you the big four. These are four that are worth your time to memorize. And you can mark it in here with a pen. Uh, I want you to highlight it. I want you to put it on a three by five when you get home. I want you to add it to the memory, put it in the memory banks, get it in the database so that you can share this with others, okay? Now, while we're still here in 1 Peter 1, one, two, three, you can remember that. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. How do we get saved? Well, it has to come from the Word of God. It's not just my testimony of what changed me. And I'll tell you what, I was going in the wrong direction, and I turned my direction. Well, that's good news and all, but it's the power of the Word of God, the Scriptures of God. This is what changes lives for salvation. Notice he says in verse 25, well, verse 24, the next verse, he says, For all flesh is as as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of grass. In other words, your body is going to fall apart like a piece of grass, and the glory, the best thing about your life here that you've built is like a flower that's going to wither and die, right? We can't keep anything here. He says, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, verse 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And there it is again, in case you missed it in the first verse, in verse 23, it is forever. And I want to prove it to you today. It says, and this is the word by the gospel, by which the gospel is preached unto you. I want to tell you, some of the other Bibles, they change the gospel. This is important. Now, if you would, go to Psalm 12. Go to Psalm chapter 12, if you would. In Matthew 13, it says, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, the Bible tells us in a parable that the seed is the Word of God. The Bible tells us we're saved by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And you know what has happened? While we've been asleep because we're distracted by every form of entertainment, the enemy has come in and he's planted fake plants. He's planted some weeds in our garden. And now something begins to spring up and we say, oh, look at that. It, it must be carrots. But what we don't know is that it's really hemlock, which looked the same, right? There's poisonous seed that has been planted, and most people cannot discern the difference. You're in Psalm 12, verse 6. I want you to see this. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God will keep His words. That's His job. God will preserve His word. That's His promise. Now, He wants to use you and your heart where you'll get it in your mind and you'll share it with others. That will help preserve it. That's where we take part. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 18, please. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Now, I brought a stack of funny Bibles. Here's the first one I'm going to pick on. This is the John MacArthur Study Bible. John MacArthur is a false prophet. He is a heretic. He preaches that you can take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. He has taught that the blood of Jesus is not how we're redeemed from our sins. And then he corrected his statement, and it's still a wrong statement. He diminishes the blood of Christ. So John MacArthur has a ton of problems, and I want to warn you, about footnote Bibles. 
I want to warn you about study Bibles. Let me tell you this, and let me give you a challenge. If, you, if you're convinced you're saved, you believe, I know I've trusted in Christ, and He's put the Holy Spirit inside of me. You don't need these crutches. You need to stand on your own two feet, and let the Holy Spirit work through you, and you get a Bible without footnotes. And when you come to something you don't know, you say, God, show me. Lord, help me to understand. You rely on the Lord in faith, and I promise you, He'll answer your prayer. Now this John MacArthur Study Bible, let me get a volunteer. Who, who wants to read a verse for me? Come on up here, Lawson. He's good at this. All right, Lawson, and here, I'll, let me get you ready. You guys are in Matthew 18. This is one of the big four that we're going to talk about today. If you'll notice, it's on your list on here. The verse has been deleted. It has been completely deleted taken away. It's hard to talk and flip. You want to flip for me? We're almost there. Don't read the footnotes. They'll mess you up, okay? Just re there you go. All right. Now, uh, I'm going to read. Go ahead. You're going to have to get near this microphone. Which verse? Verse number 11. I'll read mine first, okay? Verse number 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Jesus came to save the lost, right? Go ahead, Lawson, if you would. Read verse number 11. I don't see 11. No, no, surely it's got to be in there somewhere. No. Come on, John MacArthur wouldn't delete a whole verse out of his Bible, would he? It goes 10 to 12. Huh. So it goes from verse 10 to verse 12, and there's no 11. Here's my first point, is that salvation is under attack by the false versions. You can sit down. Thank you, young man. He, he was excited to read. So if I call on you to read and you don't feel like reading, maybe you won't have to, all right? It'll be a surprise when you get up here, okay? So the John MacArthur Study Bible has a lot of things that are actually deleted when he tells us that Jesus Christ came down to earth to save lost sinners like us, and, it, well, we'll just delete that. Well, why? We're going to talk more about the history of the Bibles this month. There is two lineages, there's two Bibles, there's two Gospels. Hey, there's two churches, and this Bible has everything. And in 1844, they dug something up, and they said, well, this one's older. Nobody's ever used it. And then in 1859, they grabbed another one, and they said, well, this one came from the Vatican, and it's older. So we're, we're going to take these two that we claim are older, that we found in the late 1800s, and we're going to use it to attack what has been established with 5,000 copies of the Bible, we're going to say, well, this one's missing a verse, so we're not going to put it in the new one that we're going to develop in the 1900s. There's a history to the Bible most people don't know. Go to, go to John 12. Go to John chapter 12 with me. I want to give you great confidence in the Word of God, what you have in your hand as a King James Bible is it. And th that phrase is under attack. Oh, you're not one of those King James guys, are you? Oh. I am. You know what? I have every verse in my Bible, and you don't, and you have something to be ashamed of, and I'm not afraid of it. And if you take these atheist challenges, you guys ever seen those where they say, there was one I did years ago where it's like 400 contradictions in the Bible. And I'm like, I don't believe it. Let's find out. I'll, I'll, I'll take the challenge myself. And many of them were changes that you find in the NIV that the King James did not change which eliminated a lot of them. And then other ones were like, well, here it says this guy had this many kids, and over here it says he had that many kids. And it's like, yeah, he kept having kids. And this one was written first. So all of the, you know, there's skeptics out there that want to take away from God's Word. And I'll tell you, there are even some hard ones. Some where you may look at it and say, hmm, why does that look like a contradiction? You know what? My faith is not in who published my Bible or how old it is. My faith is in God who made a promise and when you come from that foundation, God can answer every objection to the Bible. John 12, verse 47, And if any man hear my words and believe not, dial in on this, we're talking about salvation. If you hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You know what the NIV does right there? This Bible tested NIV positive, so we're going to handle it very carefully, okay? The NIV, in this passage, changes the gospel. We're saved by 
faith alone, not by works. We're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not by being a good person or keeping the law. Uh, John 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, wait a minute, does not keep them, works. Thank you, sir. That's right, Roy. Works. You know what the NIV wants to do? And it does it in many places. It wants to change salvation into a good work that you have to do. You have to maintain your own salvation. That's a big deal. Careful with that one. It's NIV positive. All right, 1 Corinthians 1. Go to 1 Corinthians 1 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll be brief this morning, Lord willing, and I hope it's a lot of fun. I hope this is a good challenge for you. When somebody scoffs at you for being King James only, you can say, it's not about the man King James. In fact, didn't they used to call it the authorized version? You know what they used to call it even before that? The Holy Bible. It was the Holy Bible. That's the one. It's got it all. It's put together. It's perfect. And because of the work of Tyndale uh, that came into what we call the King James today, we have the English language as it exists. I mean, this, you want a dictionary, Brother Ross was talking about in Sunday school. This is your dictionary. This put it all together. I mean, this, the English language we speak is based on this King James Bible. We learned words from this. We're talking about salvation. Of course, Ephesians 2 says that we are saved through faith. We're saved through faith. It's what you believe. Okay? 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I got to share this with somebody yesterday that thought they were saved by preaching, by being baptized. But according to this, the gospel and baptism are two separate things. Uh, I spoke to a young man yesterday. He proclaimed to be a Calvinist. He said, I know I'm going to heaven because God picked me, and I'm a Calvinist, and I believe there is nothing I could do to be saved, that God picked me, and I'm going. And I said, and I, so I, I gave him some doctrine. Now, when, as a young man, as a Calvinist, as a Presbyterian or a Reformed Baptist, you know what they do? They baptize you as a baby to enter into the covenant. Baptism is not part of salvation. Baptism is a picture of salvation. Now look at verse number 18, the next verse. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which... Everybody say it together. Unto us which... Are saved. Are saved. Are you saved? It's yes or no. I am, I am saved, right? But the new King James says, are being saved. Salvation is not a long, drawn-out process. The verdict is not out until the end of my life to see how good I was and the scales are balanced. That's not how God works. He made it clear. He made a promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, God doesn't break His Word, right? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Hey, the gift of God is eternal life. I took the gift. I have the gift. I are saved. Wait, we're not in Georgia. That's that way. Okay. I am saved, right? I am not being saved. It is not a long, drawn-out process to see how good I can get in my works. The New King James changes it to, we are being saved. Well, we'll wait and see what happens, how good you are. This, my friends, is a big deal. Now go to Acts chapter 8 for me. Acts chapter 8. So the first one that we looked at that's on the little list was Matthew 18, 11, where it deleted, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Missing from every modern Bible. Period. It's gone. You literally have to skip over it. Now some of them will put a little FN in brackets, a footnote. And you go down to the bracket and it says, well, some of the older manuscripts omit this. When they say older, they're talking about primarily two manuscripts. There are four what they call unseals. An unseal is a Bible, a book, a codex that has all capital letters with no space, none whatsoever. It's hard to read. It's difficult to look at. 
Can you imagine no spacing, all caps, everything ran together? And I mean, if your, if your word cuts off at the end, it doesn't matter. It continues all the way through. I mean, there were four primary unseals that are used for the other Bibles. And we're talking Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus. There's Alexandrius and Ephraimite. Those are the four. But the two of those that really have it all, that everybody references, is Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. There's controversy surrounding them. And because of those two books, they ignore thousands of pages and thousands of Bibles. They ignore, they ignore hundreds of years of history of known Bibles. And they say, well, we don't think that should be in there. You're in Acts chapter 8. This also is very important. Here's the next one. It's baptism. There's four things under attack we're talking about this morning. Salvation. Baptism is number two. Now, after salvation, we get baptized. It's a picture that we were dead spiritually and now we're alive forevermore. And you know what you can't do in the Bible? Baptize babies. If you have a Presbyterian or Reformed Baptist, a.k.a. a Calvinist, or an Augustinian, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a Catholic doctrine at its core. It comes from Origen and Augustine. Ask them, say, show me in the Bible where it says we put a baby underwater for salvation. Because that's what they do. They baptize a baby to enter into the covenant. That is so contrary to the Scriptures. There's not one place that you can find where they do that. In fact, let me show you the verse that they want to delete because it debunks it. First, look at verse 36. Acts 8, verse 36, it says, And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So imagine this. Let's say we take the banner down and we fill up the baptismal and you walk up here and say, well, Brother Fannin, there's water right there. What's keeping me from being baptized? Well, I'm going to make sure you're saved because too many people trust in baptism for salvation and when they sin again, they feel like they've got to go get baptized again. Verse 37 is missing from every major Bible. Look at it. It says, And, and Philip said, If thou believest... With all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What a profession of faith. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, then now you can go down into the water and come up out of the water. Tell that to the Presbyterians that want to sprinkle a baby with water. It's mind-boggling. Where do they get it from? The word baptism itself means to immerse. You're all the way completely surrounded. When we baptize, folks, you've got to go all the way under the water or we're going to do it again. Yeah. This is important because it's a symbol that we were surrounded, we're swallowed by death. I'm a dead man walking spiritually, but I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that He's the Son of God, He paid for my sins, and now I'm alive forevermore, that I should walk in newness of life. Baptism is a picture... And every other Bible, NIV, missing. John MacArthur's Bible, totally missing. It's totally gone. They've, they've omitted it completely. You'll find that also the JW Bibles typically follow that suit. And the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and your Seventh-day Adventists, that kind of thing. They also attack this. What do you have to do to be baptized? Well, believe with all your heart. If you do that then you can get baptized. Let me give you some additional... So mark that one. This is one. This is the number one place to take somebody if they have any other Bible version. And you say... And then you ask them. You put the burden of proof on them. Why is that missing from your Bible? Let them answer. Let them fumble. Oh, I don't know. I have to go ask my priest and I'll get back with you. Yeah. Good luck with that. Right? While you're in chapter 8, go back up to verse 12. Acts 8, verse 12. We see the same pattern, same doctrine. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women, uh, and little babies. Oh, I'm sorry, is that not in yours? <laughs> it's not in any of them. Men and women that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, children that can understand and believe on Jesus, they should get baptized too. But not infants, not a baby. My little baby's uh, over a year old. She cannot comprehend her sin, hell, heaven, and who the Lord Jesus Christ is. To baptize her would be heretical because you're giving a false hope. It's a false gospel. And all they're doing is just getting wet. And if somebody got baptized 
before they got saved, well, they need to get baptized again because it comes after salvation. If you remember what we read earlier, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Baptism is not part of the gospel, but it's under attack. If you would go to 1 John 5, 7. Here's number three. Our first that's under attack is salvation. All right, we need to pass the coffee around. <laughs> All right, salvation, second, baptism, this time third. We're going to talk about God and who God is and why He is under attack. If you notice, while you're turning there, let me share this little chart over here. It tells you the things that are commonly removed. The word Christ is moved, uh, well, 25 times in the NIV. 350 times they remove Lord. 292 times they remove Jesus. The word God is removed 468 times. Godhead removed all three times. Lucifer removed one time. Devil, 80 times. Hell, 40 times. Heaven, 150 times. Do you guys see a pattern? Because you notice it goes on. It talks about the blood and the atonement. What is under attack? Well, basic Christian doctrine that even children should be able to understand. They want to turn it into a word that nobody understands. Hades. Sheol. There are... Christian Bibles that have the word Sheol in place of hell, even in the New Testament, which was a Hebrew word for a hill that was on fire and it was like hell. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. Um, who was in the military? All right. That first week, the very first week that they got you, what do they call that? Boot camp. Boot camp. Yeah. What'd you call it? Hell week. <laughs> Hell week? Okay, we're going to take some soft little guy that all he does is play video games. Yeah, I want to get in the military. Okay, come on, buddy. Come into Hell week and see how we're going to turn you into a man. Right? That's what they do. That's boot camp. Why do they call it Hell week? Because it's like hell. But now, wait a minute. If they look at how we use words today, and we fast forward 200 years, the new Bibles, they'll say, well, hell in the Bible wasn't really an eternal place of hellfire in the center of earth that was used for punishment. It was kind of like going through boot camp for a week. You see what they're doing? Sheol was a, there, there was a place of a hill that was on fire that had trash. And they said, oh, well, that's all that hell was. There's no real hell. Oh, it's just like going through boot camp, doing something really hard. That's all that hell is. Hell is on this earth. No, it's not, friends. Hell is inside this earth. And if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go there and you stay there until He brings up hell and He casts it into the lake of fire for eternity. It's a sobering truth. It's a reality. You're in 1 John 5. Uh, God is under attack. Why? Well, who is God? Oh, I want to understand His nature and His character. Well, they want to delete very key verses. Look at verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen. One what? Anybody help me out? One what? God. One God. There's one God, and it's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians 13. There's a whole controversy over this doctrine, over that verse, and, and they all will, we study the scholars and those Protestant which means they protested the Catholics and came out of the Catholics, and they're still Catholic light. The Protestant scholars have decided that we don't need that verse, that it might not have really been there. However, that's not the reality. That's not, if you educate yourself, you'll find out real quick. Um, I want to read for you. Now, this is the Darby translation. John Nelson Darby is called the, the father of modern dispensationalism. He created a system of how we see the Bible. Uh, he was trained in systematic theology. He was trained in covenant theology. Covenant theology is a Calvinist doctrine, how they look at the Bible. Darby, who was also a Calvinist, responded by creating his own Calvinist view of doctrine. Darby was a fatalist. He did not believe that you had free will at all. You have zero choice. Everything you did was ordained of God and God made you do it. This is what John Nelson Darby taught. 
in 1 John 5, 7, John Nelson Darby, which there's a lot of interesting changes he makes in his Bible. And by the way, if you, if you write a Bible intention, with the intent of changing, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, what's he say? Uh, that thou shalt not diminish from his words or add to. That's what Darby did. He actually added quite a bit, whole sentences. Uh, Proverbs 30, he says, add thou not to his words, lest he be found a liar, and he reprove thee. Or uh, let me give you Revelation 22, verse 18, where it says, If any man add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. In other words, he's saying, if you will, it's an unforgivable sin in a sense, but what he's saying is, it's not something a Christian is going to accidentally do. This is somebody with intent and deceit working for Satan, to change the truth. 1 John 5, 7, For they that bear witness are three. That's John Darby. They that bear witness are three. Well, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. We call it the doctrine of the Trinity. That word may not be in the Bible, but three are one. That's pretty close to that word. There are three. Well, in Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. What's he talking about? Well, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. There is the Son that came in the form of the body. Uh, the Father said from heaven, my soul is well pleased when he got baptized, and the Spirit is the Spirit. So we're made in God's image. We're like, uh, we're made in a small version of how God is. We kind of have a likeness like him. So what does God look like? Well, kind of like a man, but not quite. Don't look at a man and say he's God. You're in 2 Corinthians, is that right? 13, this is the last verse in the books of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. That's an easy way to remember it. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's the Son, and the love of God, there's the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. You know, the CSB completely omits that. The CSB, by the way, guys, uh, is a, uh, they call it the Christian Standard Bible. It used to be called the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Do you know who owns the patent on that Bible? The, the, the trademark? The Southern Baptist Church. It is a Southern Baptist Bible. Uh, go to Romans 1, if you would. Go to Romans 1. I want you to understand who God is and that His nature is under attack in all these false Bibles. And if you pick up the wrong seed and plant it, it might actually be poison, and you may not know it until that fruit begins to grow in your doctrine. Matthew 28, of course, tells us, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Trinity is all throughout the Bible. But the, the Bible word for Trinity is Godhead. You're in Romans 1. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every one of these Bibles deletes the word Godhead. It's gone. It's missing. It's disappeared. God has order even in Himself. Go to Colossians 2. I'll show you that one also. Colossians 2, verse number 9. They are without excuse. You can see God in nature, in His creation, and you are without excuse. He tells us in John that all men are born with light. That light, it says, is Jesus Christ. He is the light that lighteth the whole world. He's the true light. By the time you get to John 3, he says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
So even as from a child you have a conscience and you have God's Spirit begins to work in you and draw you to the light, which is Christ, and you can respond to get closer to the light. And let me tell you something, even if you live in a jungle in Africa, you've never heard the name of Jesus, but you're born with that light and you begin to get closer to the light and you recognize dark is evil and hurtful and wicked and you say, I don't want to go that way. I want to get close to God by whatever name you say it in your language. Guess what is going to happen? God is going to fulfill His promise and He's going to send a preacher to you even in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa. People, you, oh, people, they only judge on what they have. No, we have the law in our heart. It's written in our conscience. The Holy Spirit bears witness. And you know what? There's a Creator. Somebody laid this out on a computer and printed it and stitched it. And somebody designed this microphone and built it and made it happen and polished it and carved all of that. Do you think there's not a Creator? The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. It's evident, it says. They're without excuse. Colossians 2, look at verse number 9. For in Him, that's Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus came in a body, and He was part of the Godhead. And He represented the fullness of the Godhead. He had all the power of the Holy Spirit on His life. And he was exercising God's will. He prayed to the Father. The Father was pleased with him. He did the will of the Father. It's so neat how it works together in unison. If you would go to Matthew 23. Go to Matthew 23. So here's my points this morning. I'm giving you the big four, if you will. Four things that are deleted from every other Bible version. Uh, and first, it was how salvation is changed. Second... It was baptism is changed. Third, it's God Himself was changed. And uh, I, I think we've got enough time. I might give you a bonus. I might give you an extra fun bonus here in just a minute. My fourth point, my last point, is hell. If you don't believe that you deserve to go to hell, then why would you believe you need to call on Jesus as a Savior? And listen, don't believe the world's version of hell, Dante's Inferno, or any of these cartoons where it's like the devil's down there poking people. No, no, no. The devil's not in hell right now. One day the devil will be cast down into hell, and he will be tormented on fire like everybody else. His day's coming. The devil is an angel that has rebelled. He is a spirit that can see things that we can't. And we can't see spirits like they can. And he's down here accusing the brethren and tempting the brethren and causing people uh, to be possessed and to fall and destroy them. One day the devil will have his day in hell. Matthew 23, this was Jesus preaching to the religious crowd, to the Pharisees. Uh, if you would, look at verse 14. This verse is totally deleted from every other Bible. Matthew 23, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make a long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. A pretense. They're pretending, they're faking, they want to come in and pray some big prayer. And they want to take what a widow has left over. That's wicked. And Jesus said, you have a, listen to what He said, a greater damnation. You know what that means? They have a hotter hell. False prophets that speak in the name of Jesus to steal from people, they have a hotter hell. If you just die in your ignorance or your selfishness, your will to not submit to Christianity or to God or Jesus, and you die and you go to hell, you will be punished for your sins. And you don't have to because Jesus paid for them. But the false prophet, the fake religious crowd that would try to take from people, that wants to hurt people, that wants to lie to people, Jesus said they have a hotter hell. Woe unto them, He said. Woe unto you. If you would, go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. This is another omission. Same topic of hell. So the big four were Matthew 18, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Deleted. Uh, baptism, Acts 8.37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Deleted. 
1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one, deleted. So God is under attack. Hell is under attack because if they can, there was an old story and I forget who it was and I know some of y'all know it, but it was a the story a guy said, how can we convince people to go to hell? And there were the three little devils. Um, it was an author, I forget his name, but nonetheless, the sum of the story was, one devil said, I know what we'll do. We'll tell people that, that, you know, that hell's not that bad. Another one had a story. And the last one, he said, I know what we'll do. We'll just tell people they have all the time in the world to decide. And then they'll end up in hell. Today is the day of salvation. When you're presented with the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit begins to prick your heart and say, Hey, man, I'm talking to you. I love you. I died for your sins. Won't you take the gift? That's the time of salvation. Mark chapter 9, look what he says in verse 44. This is deleted from the other Bibles. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life, having two feet, to be cast into hell, than to the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Again, hell's forever. You're in there forever. Verse 47, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Listen, you don't have to cut your hand off to go to heaven. You don't have to pop your eyeball out to go to heaven. What he's trying to tell you is, we in our flesh have these besetting sins and we begin to love the things in the world and the pleasure that we get from them so much that we will not receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. Go to Revelation chapter 1. I knew a guy years ago, and he was, he was a drunkard. He could not stand it. He couldn't control himself. He had hurt people. He had been in so many wrecks. He had no driver's license. And he, he asked for prayer because the doctor told him, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to have to cut your foot off because your, your body is so acidic that it's just eating you up. Your foot is blistered and infected, and we're going to have to cut your foot off to save your life. But if you stop drinking, you might be able to turn it around. Every time I read this verse, I think of that man because he understood that salvation was free. But he always said, I'm just not ready. Because there was always another drink in the fridge. He lost his foot. If it came down to the Lord saying, hey man, you got a problem with your eyeballs, what you're looking at, or your hands, what you're touching and doing, or your lust for money, or your covetousness, or your pride for prestige and preeminence, and, and it came down to you being able to sacrifice that and save yourself from going to hell, you'd say, man, cut my hand off, let's get it over with, because I want to go to heaven. But the good news is you don't have to. But don't let things in this earth stand in the way of you accomplishing faith in Christ. Revelation 1, verse 18, if you would look at that, verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus is alive forevermore. He's in heaven right now. He's going to come back one day. He has the keys to the door of hell and he can lock that door when you believe on him and you'll never go there. But until then, that door's open. He has the keys of hell and death. Every other Bible changes this. Most of them just delete the word hell. Many turn it into Hades. Wait, Haiti? Isn't that a country in the islands? No, Hades. Oh, you mean a mythological place that the philosophers taught? Why would they change it? Because they don't want you to be afraid of hell. They don't want you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you one last litmus test. I'm going to give you two bonuses real quick. Genesis 1-1, turn there. If you're ever in a hotel room and there's one of those Gideon Bibles in there, I have discovered not all Gideons are created equal. <laughs> they officially only distribute in the ESV that's this one, the extremely silly version, I think is what I called it, All right? And the KJV, officially, however, they have several sister organizations, 
that are under the umbrella that can distribute whatever they want. So I have a New King James Gideon Bible, and they'll, they'll officially say, we don't do that. Oh, but our sister organizations can. So you never really know what you're going to get when you go to a hotel and you open up, well, what is it? You know? Well, here's, I'm going to give you the two verses as a quick litmus test. It's John 1.1 1, 1 and Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. You're in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. This is super important because if the devil's going to attack anything, don't you think he would attack the first verse? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Is that what it says? Yes. Amen. Every other Bible changes it to read, God created the heavens. Plural. You say, what's the big deal? Aren't there three heavens? There are. There's heaven, God's throne. It's called the third heaven. It's called the celestial heaven where you go whenever you die until he comes back and we go into the, there's, there's future stuff, right? But that's it. Then there's the second heaven. We call it space. You could call it cosmos. Then there's this last heaven, the one closest to us, and it's called the sky. The birds fly in the heavens. That's a, a phrase used in the Bible. Typically, when we say heaven today in 2023, we're talking about the place where your soul goes. Back then, it was like, well, there's the sky as a heaven, and space is a heaven, and celestial, the spiritual, that's a heaven also. So there's the three. Did God create all three on day one? Absolutely not. In fact, if he could change one letter to change one verse, to make the first verse of the Bible a contradiction, what in the devil? Yea, hath God said. <clears throat> now, if you would look at verse number 8, it says, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Uh, verse 6, he says, And God said, Let there be a firmament. Verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven. So God created His dwelling place because He created His throne, and that throne won't last forever. God's forever, but not that heaven. There's a new heaven coming. And then the second day, God created another heaven on the earth that He would ultimately split again and give us what He calls later the open firmament of heaven. He creates all three in the first week, but He did not create all three in the first day. If your Bible says heavens, it's a contradiction. It literally makes God a liar. Now, that being the litmus test, I've got a special Bible here. This is called an inspired version. It has another name. The Holy Scriptures inspired version containing the Old and the New Testaments, an inspired revision of the authorized version by Joseph Smith, Jr. You guys know who he is? Yeah. The Mormons, Church of Latter-day uh, Saints, they call it. A reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Mormons believe a lot of heresy. There is Freemasonic doctrine, which is pagan, in this Bible, in the book of Genesis. They change so much, it blows my mind. Listen, you look at Genesis 1-1, and let me read you Genesis 1-1 out of the Mormon Bible. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I reveal unto you concerning this heaven and this earth, right in the words which I speak. Are we close? Even vaguely similar? Drastically different? Yes. Another testament, a false witness? There's some really bizarre stuff, uh, some stuff not even fit for children, right here in Genesis. I'd be glad to show you afterwards. Go to John 1.1, 1, 1, the other litmus test. John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have the New World Translation. They famously changed theirs back in like 1960 or 61 because they recognized that they were acknowledging Jesus as God. And it was okay to worship God, so they had to modify their scriptures. So the new versions, which I think they primarily have a 2011 version, is the big one that they're carrying today. Uh, it's, it's totally different. So you go to John 1.1 1, 1 on any other Bible, you're going to find it different usually. That doesn't hold true for all of these necessarily, uh, but for the occults it always does because they don't see Jesus as God. John 1.1. 1, 1. Oh, let me catch up. Well, let's see... Uh, Let's see, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who's the Word? God. Jesus. 
Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. Uh, in, in your Bible, in verse 1, next look at verse 14, where it says, And the Word, that's Jesus, was made flesh. What part of God was made flesh? The Son, that's Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full in grace and truth. In your bulletin, you notice your KJV vocab word for this week is begotten. It means brought forth. Well, I have it underlined in green in my Bible, so that tells me that they deleted it in all the other Bibles. We can check it out, and it's probably true. Now look at verse 34. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John 1, 1, John 14, John 34, we see the Son of God is the Word of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Creator. He's our Judge. He's our Savior. Basic doctrine. John 1 is so powerful. There's like, I don't know, 15 or 18 different names for Jesus in this chapter. Now, you look at John 1, 1, and let me read you the Mormon version. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. For those that don't know, the Mormons teach that Jesus is the brother to Lucifer, they teach that Jehovah happens to be one of the gods, one of millions, and he's one of the god, he's the god for this planet. They teach that Joseph Smith is now an ascended master, and for you to leave earth, you have to know a secret handshake which comes from the masons. When you meet Joseph Smith in heaven, and if you pass all of these tests, then you can be just like Joseph Smith, who will be a god of his own planet one day. And he'll have a bunch of virgins that he can repopulate the planet with, with a bunch of spirit babies. I'm not making any of this up. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes. It's bizarre. Where does it come from? Joseph Smith was possessed with a devil. He wrote his own Bible, which the Bible tells us the man that does that, he just, I mean, write him off. It takes a wicked person. Look, it's one thing when, when you're preaching and quoting a, a scripture, and you say, I, I've done it where I said, it's supposed to say he, and I said she. And boy, I, somebody gave it, like, you said this, or you're supposed to say Jesus, and you, I said the devil one time, and they're like, whoa, hey man, you mixed them up. I'm talking about both, and you know, you're, you're talking and looking at people, and you're getting strange looks from some people. You know, messes you up while you're talking. It's one thing to mess up. It's one thing to write it down incorrectly. But it's a whole other thing when you have an intention. I know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Freemasonry, and I'm going to merge it with Protestant Christianity, and I'll make the newest, biggest Protestant religion, and then we'll conquer true biblical Christianity. And you take a little here and a little there and you devise up and you make up new things and you change history and you change the Bible. That's what he did. What a wicked heart. Yeah. Last thought for the day. I appreciate your patience. I hope you've learned something. I hope you find this as a valuable tool and you'll learn how to navigate it so you can share it with others and they can learn. I gave you the big four which teach us that salvation was changed, baptism, God, and hell there's one last thing I want you to see in Matthew 17. Turn there real quick. You're not far from it. Just go back a little bit. Matthew 17, verse number 21. And this one is completely deleted from all the other Bible versions. It's, it's gone. But it's important for you. It's about the power of prayer. Now, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you to help you pray to God through the name of the Son. And look what's missing, verse 21. Matthew 17, verse 21. How be it, this kind, what kind? Well, we're talking about a spirit, a evil spirit that was possessing somebody. And he says, hey, this kind of evil spirit doesn't go away except, look what he says, how be it, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Prayer and and fasting. Look, if you want to put your prayer in high gear, <laughs> add some nitro to it, add some fasting. I ask you, and, and please don't answer, I don't intend to do it to embarrass anybody, but when is the last time you prayed and fasted? 
Jesus said, when you pray, and then he went on and he said, when you fast, and so he's expecting you to fast, that means to go without. There are many things in your life that you can go without. In 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about in the marriage relationship that there's a time to stop the physical, like, hey, it's prayer and fasting time. I need to get close to God. I'm going to withhold from our marriage relationship if I have consent from my spouse. Uh, withholding from food and drink is what he's talking about. Maybe it's certain drinks. Maybe it's like, I got a soda problem. I'm going to cut off the soda. Maybe, ooh, ooh, maybe it's a coffee problem. I'm going to cut off the coffee and I'm going to cut off the food and I'm going to afflict my flesh so I can get close to God. Hey, maybe it's a, a social media addiction. Maybe you're addicted to your cell phone. You know, if the devil could just get you to bring your cell phone into church to where you can sit here and play tiddlywinks while the preacher's preaching the Word of God, then Satan can get a hold of your mind. Face it, guys, our phone is addictive. Your television programming is addictive. There, I mean, sh tell me one of those commercials that glorifies Jesus as God or tells you, believe on the Lord or tells you prayer and fasting. Satan has deleted this out of the Bibles because he wants Christians to be powerless in their prayer. If you want real power, in your prayer life, if you say, I don't know, I just feel like prayer doesn't really work anymore for me. Have you tried fasting? I fast every day. I'm so holy. And then I wake up and I break the fast. I'm joking. That's breakfast. That's where we get the word. You break the fast, okay? Every, every time I go to sleep, I fast for a little while, okay? Well, I'm talking about doing it while you're awake. From the things you desire, that can be a stumbling block getting you closer to God. Whatever, I mean, you know, most apps on your phone, some of them will tell you how many minutes or hours or ooh, how many days you've spent looking at that app. You know, I have, an, I have a Bible. It's better than a phone. It has applications also. But you got to open it up and get the application. If we would treat our Bible better than our cell phone, when's the last time you left the house and you're like, oh, 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 I don't have my phone. I got to go back. We got to go back, turn around. I don't care if we're late. I can't go anywhere without it. Have you ever done that with your Bible? Last Father's Day, we gave out those little waterproof camouflage, uh, I called it an everyday carry, an everyday Christian, little pocket New Testament. Man, you can take it everywhere. We got so many Bibles here. Put one in your truck. Put one in your house. Put one at work. They're free. The deal is, if you'll pray God's Word back to Him, and bigger than that, if you'll fast while you're doing it, you will get answers in your life. God wants you to get in the Bible and pray, and if you need some strong, you need some big answers, you better fast. We are kind of commanded to do it. He says, when you fast. He says, assuming that we will. And if we want to be good Christians, I would assume that you want to. And I don't say this to pick on you. And maybe you say, well, I can't. I've got a medical condition or something. I, you know, maybe a, a mama that's breastfeeding a baby. I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to be your doctor. But I'm here to tell you this. I promise you this. If you'll take that to heart and say, why did they delete the verse that says prayer and fasting has great power? And then apply it to your life. And say, oh God, I want to be a better Christian. I'm willing to pray and fast for a day or a couple days or whatever is necessary until I hear from you. There's power in the Word. There's power in prayer. Uh, don't give in to the false Bibles. And when somebody says, well, they're all the same, I want you to at least know these big four. They changed salvation. They changed baptism. They changed heaven. They changed who God is. They've changed hell and prayer and many other things. Please take this home and study it. I promise it will be a blessing to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And Lord, I love your word. I pray that you would use this month as we really dig into the origins, the history, and the application of the Bible. I pray you would use it for spiritual growth. Lord, I do ask that you would do a mighty work in this church and help us to be a shining light in a dark time. And Lord, we're trusting in you. We're relying in you. And Lord, we can't do anything without you. Oh, I love you so much, Lord. I pray you would fill us with the Holy Spirit as we sing this last song. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.